in Slovakia and Poland and those who are enduring the fires and the terror that comes with war. If you're not familiar with the, this chant or some of the other things that Lutherans do during their worship, don't worry about that. They come over time. And uh, if you're not familiar with any of the music, just let the words in the music wash over you and uh, inspire you. And, uh, and over, uh, in, in the course of time, um, it will become something that you want to sing along with as well. We begin with the Ukrainian Orthodox chant. Here we are. Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal and mercy. We begin with a thanksgiving for baptism. Oh. Blessed are you, O God, maker and ruler of all things. Your voice thundered over the waters at creation. You water the mountains, fill the lakes, and send springs into the valleys to refresh and satisfy all living things. Amen. Through the waters of the flood, you carried the ark to safety. Through the sea, you led your people from slavery to freedom. In the wilderness, you nourished them with water from the rock, and you brought them across the River Jordan to the promised land. Amen. In the baptism of his death and resurrection, your son Jesus carries us to safety and freedom. Like lightning, Satan falls. You claim us as your daughters and sons, no longer slave versus free, male versus female. Each is unique, but also one with all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Pour out your spirit of holiness upon us. Let us put on Christ like a baptismal garment. Make us a joyful presence to the hurting, like a cup of cool water in life's desert. Make us better stewards of your gift of water, of the earth, of our time, and our talents, so that the world may know your peace and your truth. In Christ, with Christ, through Christ, for the sake of a hurting world. Amen. 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 That. I have to read that. Please. God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We sing together hymn number 453. Those of us who like, please stand as we sing here.
a children's story. On that note, hi. Somebody's coming, somebody's coming, somebody's coming. Two somebody's are coming, three somebody's are coming. Hi. Nice drumming. Nice to have you drum. Nice haircut, too. Happy haircut. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Hello. Hi. Have some fl Look at you all. How nice to have you all. I have, haven't seen you yet this summer. It's nice to see you. Yeah, floor is good. We like floor. You doing okay? What you got, pal? Is that like for getting vaccines? Yeah, cool. I'm glad I got mine. I got my vaccine. I'm glad. I didn't get one like that because that's really, really big. And that would have scared me if I'd had one that big. Wow. Hi. How are you? You like my mask? You think cute? Yeah. I have a story for you. It's a story about a burning bush. A burning bush. It goes like this. M Moses was out watching his sheep where the land runs long. The land rolls deep. Here it is. Here's his land with his burning bush. He saw a living f bush of fire burning with flames that did not tire. There's a sheep over there, too, which is kind of cool. I got sheeps. Sheeps? Sheeps. From the bush, God's voice said, Be strong. Help my people who have suffered so long. So Moses walked with a staff in his hand. That's that thing right there. That's that thing right there. It looks like a candy cane. That's his staff. So Moses walked with a staff in his hand, and he led the people to God's promised land. Here's somebody that's listening to that story. <clears throat> and her name, oops, bye. Time to get our shot somewhere else. This story is called Cooling Down. And one of the reasons I like this story is because it was written by a friend of mine. That's a friend of mine. Honey Lynn is three. Oops, bye. <laughs> Don't anybody else leave. Honey Lynn is three. She lives in Cambodia. When it is hot, she likes to drink sugarcane juice. It feels good to cool down a little. There's a picture of Honey Lynn in Cambodia. I think my friend probably took that picture, too. One more part to this story. Jesus feeds the people. Jesus teaches near the shore where thousands of people wait for more. Jesus tells stories, heals and loves them. He asks his friends to go and feed them. Only two fish? Five loaves? No way. We don't have enough, his friends say. But Jesus has them all sit down. He blesses, shares the food all around. Everyone has enough to eat, and there are leftovers. What a treat. You like leftovers? You like leftovers? What's your favorite leftover? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I wholeheartedly agree. Summer sounds like splish splash of water. The clip clop of running feet. Fireworks that go kaboom. We're going to have those in a couple of weeks, right? Birds that go tweet, tweet, tweet. Picnics at church, a good church song, and thanking God for sunshine all summer long. So this is a story for a drummer and some singers. Johann came from a musical family, and as a boy, he sang in the choir. As a grown-up, he played the organ. Johann wrote easy music to teach to his children. He wrote hard music to play in beautiful churches. He wrote all of his music to praise God. There he is, Johann Sebastian Bach.
Isn't that a mouthful? He was a great composer and an arranger of music. He was born into a musical family. He spent his life in Germany. He was a musical director, a composer, and an all-around pretty good musician. Here's a song that Sebastian Bach wrote. The words go like this. Let the whole creation cry, God, glory to the Lord on high. Heaven and earth awake and sing praise to our almighty King. Praise God, angel hosts above, ever bright and fair in love. Sun and moon, lift up your voice. Night and stars in God rejoice. So these are all stories about seeing and hearing God, singing God, especially in summer. Would you like the book? No? Would you like the book? You may have it. Nobody wants the book. Would you like the book? Well, you may have the book. Take that with you. Thanks for coming. Let us pray. Put our hands together, make a clapping sound when we do. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all that we can see and all that we can hear of your beautiful creation and of the faces and voices of the people around us who love us, for mothers and fathers and people in the church who all want the best for us and have promised that they'll be there for you no matter what. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Thanks for being here. It's nice to see you guys. Well, I'm going to go back to my seat, and maybe you want to, too. Thanks. Nicely done, Barb. <clears throat> yes, sir? You going to go sit down? Or you're just going to stay right here? All right. Whatever works for you. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing together Psalm 15. Take back. 
from Colossians. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Christ, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. Christ himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Christ to reconcile to God's own self all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Christ has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before God, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to the saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is Christ whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and peace be to you, the reader. Mary, I'm going to need that. We sing the Alleluia. Those who would like, please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Now, as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him to, into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> if you live in the desert, the hospitality shown by Abraham and Sarah is a matter of life and death. Three strangers appear, far enough away that Abraham runs to meet them. He begs them not to pass by. 
He offers a little, but delivers a lot. He suggests a little water to wash by. Water which is very precious in the desert and becoming increasingly sacred, scarce, and contentious in the American West. Abraham offers to bring a little bread, but he delivers cheese, milk, tender and good veal, and three measures of flour become cakes, three measures being three bushel baskets worth. Welcoming the stranger is a biblical mandate. It's good theology. It's life or death. Bad theology, and people in the desert die. Theology is not a word that rattles easily off your tongue. I know that. But it's also not a word to describe pious church talk on a Sunday morning for the well-mannered and the well-dressed. Theology means how we describe and how we act on our most deeply held hopes, aspirations, values. How we live out those deepest hopes and aspirations. Hopes for ourselves, for our children, for our community, for our world. Everyone expresses their hopes and their values and their aspirations. Non-Christians and Christians alike have theology, whether they know it or not, whether they call it that or not, whether they like it or not. In 1765, a Monsieur Boulanger opened a soup shop on the streets of Paris. He posted a sign in the window that contained Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 11. In English, that would be, Come unto me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will restore you. His establishment came to be known as a restaurant, or in French, a restaurant. Matthew 11, verse 28. And yes, there's a book called Food, A History of Restaurants. Jesus goes on from this passage to say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest for your souls. The epistle to the Hebrews makes use of this Abraham and Sarah story in the desert. It alludes to the story of Abraham and Sarah and says, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. The King James was better. It says, some have entertained angels unawares. Abraham Lincoln, in his first inaugural address, called a bitterly divided country to rise to the better angels of its nature. A month later, the Civil War broke out. The country was on fire. It was not a good year for Abraham Lincoln or for the better angels of our nature. The country was on fire. And you may well feel that the country, the world, is on fire right now. Measured by worldwide hurt, pain, and anger, the world is on fire. Climate change has led to literal fires in Europe and in America, growing deserts in Africa and Asia. War in Ukraine is in its fifth month, setting fire to cities and killing the innocent. Young men fire on schools and cities, shopping centers, and even Fourth of July parades. Black men are so afraid of police officers that they run when they probably shouldn't. But 46 bullets in Akron, Ohio, and a knee on the neck in Minnesota, the fear and the anger spread like wildfire. 
Recent Supreme Court decisions have left many Americans hurting and angry. The decisions have been championed by some, and others are terrified that they are no longer protected by their nation's laws. Championed mostly by those who think that it is their obligation to impose their values, their aspirations, their theology on other people. A slight majority is anti-abortion, but most of them are not pro-legislation. They know that abortion exists not for the healthy, the happy, those whose lives are good. It exists for those whose lives, whose situations have gone bad. And a theology that doesn't take into account how things can go really, really wrong is bad theology. Bad theology and people die. There are two bad theologies that I run into all the time. One is re when religion is painted as some sort of narrow balance beam. The demands of this God are so, well, demanding that most people will fall off and never recover. The yoke is not easy, the burden unbearable, especially when it seems that there are Bible-clobbering sticks in the hands of other fellow Christians trying to knock you off. The other bad theology I hear all the time is God as invisible friend. Pray and the gay will go away. Feel sad or depressed? You have an invisible rabbit there who loves you by your side. It's easy to say God loves you and then walk away. As easy as it is to say thoughts and prayers. Much harder to be Christ-like, to be the very present image of the invisible God, as Colossians calls it, to literally embody the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations. Now, without getting too deep into the problems of the Mary and Martha story, not my mother's favorite story, my mother Martha, her cousin Mary didn't seem to mind it too much. Martha is described as distracted. Literally, the word means wheeled around, like someone grabbing you by the arm and flinging you from thing to thing distracted, knocked off the track. You may well feel that way in a world on fire, or anxious or troubled, which are the other words that Jesus uses. I was talking to a young man recently, one whom I respect, who no longer attends church. Let me be honest, he no longer attends this church. He might be, given the influences in his life, what some call an ex-evangelical. So I asked him one time, what would be a better way to talk about religion that might work for him? Hopes, aspirations, values. And he said that maybe not to anthropomorphize the deity. He was a philosophy major not to anthropomorphize the deity. That's a pretty sophisticated way of saying he'd had enough of balanced beam theology and invisible rabbits. I've been thinking about what he said for a very long time. And what I realized is that as Lutherans, we don't anthropomorphize the deity. What we say is there is nothing about God that is worth saying that doesn't make a difference in a person's life and we use a life to image that God. Now, we could use my life as your model, but I'm here to tell you that that's eventually gonna let you down. We might use Kurt's, that would be good, but I think even Kurt would get to the point where he would say that he is a saint and a sinner at the same time also. What we do is we use the life of Jesus to say, here is the image 
of the invisible God. Jesus calls us not to be wheeled around by every distraction, by every fire that seems to be out there. Jesus calls us to be like firefighters who know how to aim the water at the base of the fire and not get distracted by every single flame. The one thing that is needed is that single-mindedness on being the restorant to the oppressed. And by oppressed, I mean everyone whose life is hard and is made harder by knowing that we have the power to make it easier. Abraham didn't ask if the strangers in the desert were Christians first. He didn't ask them if they would accept Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Abraham was more concerned with what would become of Abraham if he neglected to show the hospitality in the desert where people die. The balanced beam narrow gauntlet doesn't hold up when Colossians tells us that through Christ, God reconciles to himself all things. If you're a Lutheran, at least, all means all, whether on earth or on heaven, and the result is peace. A truly restorant assembly will single-mindedly aim their words and their deeds at the hurting, at the fearful, at the wheeled around, those whose lives are not good but have become merely survival. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the world has now come of age. And he was right. We have the power to destroy the planet several times over in wars. We also have the power to let it slowly warm itself to death. We have the power to make life more fulfilling, less desperate. We have the power to do better. In my more cynical moments, I think that it must be nice to be a pastor so solidly one-sided on one side of an issue or another that you can't even hear the fears or the tears of people on the other side. It must make it easy to be so certain of your righteousness ways that we can't even see the victims. We have the power to do better. What Jesus calls us to do is to aim the fire hose directly at the source of the flame. Now, as soon as I say that, I'm also aware that Jesus never told the Roman Empire once what they had to do. He never attacked their policies. He's never picketed or demanded that their policies, procedures change. What Jesus did was he said religion had to do better. Had to do better than empire. You know, there are still Christians out there who are saying that it's a failure to trust God if you take the vaccine. I'd like to suggest that it's tempting God if we reject technology, knowledge, people's experience in a world come of age. Read one way, the scriptures present a God who delights in genocide, rape, slavery, the execution of nonconformists, and for centuries, scripture was used to justify massacres of unbelievers, the oppression of women, the beating of children, the persecution of homosexuals, and the ownership of slaves. Read another way, the scriptures present the sins of the past as glaringly illuminated with the light shining on them so that we are not doomed to repeat them, let alone ensconce them into our laws. Rather, the biblical story challenges us to find the better angels of our nature, to run like Abraham did to those who are thirsty for acceptance, to run to those who need hope, need welcome. Colossians did not warn us that we are doomed if we fall away from the faith. 
Colossians warns us that we're doomed if we fall away from hope, the kind of hope that faith engenders. People without hope die. Abraham ran. He didn't wait for a knock on the tent. To be the image of an invisible God is to listen, like Mary and Martha, to what those in the desert have to say. I wonder if we could be a church eager to run to listen, ready with a little water to wash with, a little bread to eat with, the church would be all ears to hear their stories, ready with Kleenex by the bushel basketful, eager to run back then to church with new stories of new signs of God's grace, of Christ who reconciles the estranged in whom all things hold together, especially when it feels like nothing is holding together. Hebrews continues with this story of Abraham and Sarah. It says, let mutual love continue. Run to show hospitality to the hurting, for some have discovered angels unawares. And then it goes on with these words that I want to leave you with today. Hebrews goes on to say, it is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Catch those words. It is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Amen. Creed first. The Maasai Creed. We believe, we believe in the, in the one, one high God, God who out of love created the beautiful world and everything good in it, who created humankind and wanted us to be happy in the world. God loves the world and every nation and tribe on the earth. We have known this high God in darkness, and now we know this high God God promised in the book of the Word, the Bible, that God would save the world and all the nations and tribes. We believe that God made good this promise by sending the Son, Jesus Christ, a man in the flesh, a Jew by tribe, born poor in a little village, who left his home and was always on the safari doing good, curing people by the power of God teaching about God and humankind, showing the meaning of religion is love. He was rejected by his people, tortured and nailed hands and feet to a cross and died. He lay buried in the grave, but the hyenas did not touch him. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. He ascended to the skies. He is the Lord. We believe that all our sins are forgiven through Jesus. All who have faith, who are sorry for their sins, who are baptized in the Holy Spirit of God, live the rule of love and share the bread together in love to announce the good news to others until Jesus comes again. We are waiting for him who is alive, who lives. This we believe. Amen. We sing together hymn 513, 513.
Thanks for remembering, John. As we pray together, I'll say a one-sentence prayer petition, end it with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and have you respond all together, receive our prayer. These first few prayer petitions I'll use come from the Swedish Lutheran hymnal from 1924, the ancestor hymnal, the first English hymnal for this congregation. Please rise as we pray together. Almighty and merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks for all your goodness and tender mercies. Be gracious unto us and remember not our sins. Sanctify and guide us through your Holy Spirit and grant that we may walk in holiness of life according to thy word. Lord, in your mercy. Unite, strengthen, and preserve thy church through the word and the holy sacraments. Have mercy, O oh Lord, on all the nations that walk in darkness and that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. And cause the saving and life-giving light of thy gospel to shine graciously upon us. Lord, in your mercy. Be thou the strength and stay of our land. Give it grace and honor. Grant health and prosperity to all in authority, especially the President and the Congress of the United States, the Governor and the Legislature of this state, and to all our judges and magistrates. And do them with grace to rule after your good pleasure, to the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Lord, in your mercy. Help us, O oh God, that we may live together in peace and concord with true counsel in all that we undertake. Prosper every good work and turn us away from all harm and evil. May thy blessing rest upon the fruits of the earth and give success to every lawful occupation on land and sea. Lord, in your mercy. Let the light of thy word ever shine within our homes. Keep the children in the covenant which you have made with them in holy baptism, and give all parents and teachers grace to nurture them in truth and worship. Bless, we pray thee, the church and all of its institutions, its colleges, seminaries, and agencies, relief workers, and famine relief organizations that they may bring forth women and men to serve in the ministry of the word, in the ministry of mercy, and in all walks of life. Lord, in your mercy. Help and comfort the sick and the poor, the oppressed and those who mourn, the afflicted and the dying. Graciously protect all widows and orphans and the strangers who sojourn in our land. Support us in our last hour, and after this transitory life, give us eternal blessedness. Lord, in your mercy. God, our creator, you feed the whole earth with your goodness. As we give you thanks for the abundance of the earth, for seed time and harvest, we offer praise for Christ, the bread of life. Lord, in your mercy. Keep us faithful to the word and lead us to share all that you give us with the hungry, the sick, and the forgotten ones of our land. Bless us with grateful hearts as we long for the day when all people be, will be fed with the harvest of justice. Lord, in your mercy. For those you have given to us to love and to care for, we pray for Helen and Mary, Marlene, Elaine, Ruth and Nancy, Bernie and Marty, Gil and Carol. 
Make your healing power in all of their lives be a sign to us of your grace in all of ours. Lord, in your mercy. And as we pray for our own members and families, we especially today remember our sister Helen. We thank you for the grace she has shown throughout her life, her gift and love of song and music. Lord, in your mercy. And as we pray for our own congregation, we pray for the people of Lord of Life in Portage, for Salem Lutheran in Flint, for our Synod Bishop Craig, our presiding Bishop Elizabeth, for our partners in faith in Salud, Para La Vida, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, Papua New Guinea, Slovakia, Serbia, for people of the gospel throughout the world, Lord, in your mercy. Hear all of the prayers and concerns that we lift up before you now, silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. Hear all of the prayers and concerns that we lift up to you, give over to your arms, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be God's gift to you. We welcome all to join us at this communion table. If you are at home and wish to gather bread and wine or juice to commune with us at this time, this is a good time to do that. If you are waiting until that time when you can commune in this place, we honor that as well. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. You are our maker, redeemer, and healer, and you give us a harmonious world where the plants and the animals, the seas and the stars are filled with order and beauty. But when sin had scarred the world, you sent your son, Jesus, to heal our ills and to form us again into one. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was given to betrayal and death, took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for my remembrance. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for my remembrance. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life, Amen. Send your spirit on us and on this meal. As grains scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Amen. Through your Son, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. <clears throat> as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Come to the table.
this is an opportunity for you to share some of the signs of God's grace that you've seen or things for which you're thankful. Good morning. <clears throat> oh, I touched the mic. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hide behind the post so he can't see me. Um, a lot of you probably know this was a garden tour this weekend. And um, I got the opportunity to be a special up to enjoy that a lot because Sue, through all her work that she did in our garden, put us on the garden tour. So we had the blessing of people coming, friends coming that we hadn't seen, new friends that we made, an artist displaying her works and painting in our driveway, not on the driveway, but actually painting like an adult, on a, you know, not cement chalk. And um, we had beautiful scarves that were made and a demonstration of scarf making and the scarves were sold and, and money was split between the Arts Council and, and Hope Scarves. And um, it, was, it was incredible to see the community, all that talent, um, all the good feelings that, that we all shared. Um, I feel like I'm leaving something out. Oh, the volunteers. Oh, and we left early because uh, we went with Doug and Barb to celebrate Jim and Sandy Foster's 50th wedding anniversary. And while we were gone, Carol Brantois and another musician came and played uh, flutes, some flute music in our yard as part of the uh, activity. So it was just an amazing event and uh, really, really uh, grateful to be part of that. It was really neat. I'm grateful for family visiting, and this is that time of year. So at the moment, it's my niece and great nephews from New Mexico, and they're tall and handsome, and I think, really, are they related to me? But anyway, it's, it's lovely, and I know I'm not the only one with family visiting, and it's just so blessed. Thank you for all of your prayers and your uh, concerns for how Monica is doing. Um, the knee is progressing well. Um, she's having a little more um, inordinate pain than they're hoping that she's having. Um, standing on that knee is still causing her, causing her a lot of problems. Um, so she's still not moving around too much. Um, but uh, the healing process is continuing. So thank you very much for, for, for your concerns. We sing together in our red books, number 737, 737. Please.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence that we may treasure your word through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now these words from Genesis 31, verse 49. The Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent from one another. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.